everyone, and welcome to Living One. I am Olivia Crossman, your host. Living One is a monthly webinar series in which presenters from around the world share their vision for a future where all Earth beings live as one community in peace, dignity, and freedom. We ask the question, we know what's wrong, but what does white right look like? This fall marked the beginning of Living One's fourth year, but today these conversations are more important than ever. For they are more than conversations. They are opportunities to build community, solve for the isolating wounds of our time. Today we have the second session of our special autumn series, Reparation, Restoration, and Recognition. Concluding over the next week, two workers share their experiences and insights in reparative and restorative work that forges healing paths for Earth's renewal. Recognition and reparation are necessary steps to erase the footprint of racism and speciesism. Reparation and reinstatement of indigenous sovereignty are critical elements for spiritual and material renewal. We are delighted to have you join us as we explore this important topic together. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are all currently on various different Indigenous lands. I am currently on the ancestral homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, which includes the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. This land exists also as a place of trade with other Indigenous communities, including the Ho-Chunk, Miami, Menominee, Sauk, and Meskwaki. The Krulo Center for Nonviolence, located in Southern Oregon, is also the homelands of the Grizzly Bear, Tacoma, and Gray Wolf. To recognize the land is to recognize the lasting effects of colonization, genocide, and oppression that still impact indigenous communities today. But it is also an expression of gratitude and appreciation for the land and for all those whose homelands we live and work on. In the fifth of this six part series, we welcome Dr. Mary Watkins. In White Work, Reparative Genealogy and Ecological Restoration, Mary explores the relationship between reparative genealogy and racial and environmental reparations, which she will discuss today. She will recount some of her ancestral legacy and efforts of repair, including her great-grandfather's contribution to the decimation of the Mississippi woods and the, anim the animals after the Civil War. Mary is Professor Emerita of Psychology at Pacifica Graduate Institute, where she taught 27 years and co-founded the Community Liberation Indigenous and Eco-Psychologies Program. Among other numerous publications, Mary is the author of Mutual Accompaniment and the Creation of the Commons, which describes a radical model of psycho psychosocial and ecological accompaniment, and is the co-author of Up Against the Wall, which reimagines national borders as sites of hospitality in an era of forced migration. Before we begin, let me share a few logistical notes. Mary will be speaking for about 45 minutes, after which we will open a question and answers period when you're invited to type your questions into the chat, which we will read after Mary's presentation. Also, please note that the Zoom session will be recorded. So if you would feel more comfortable leaving your camera off or changing your Zoom name, please feel free to do so. Finally, we ask that unless you are currently speaking, you keep your microphone muted to avoid any unintended interruptions. So without further ado, we welcome Dr. Mary Watkins and Dr. Gabe Bradshaw. Hello everyone. Hi, Mary. Hi. It's a delight to have this uh, moment or moments on a wintry Sunday this year. So thank you all for coming and I hope you're warm with your tea and cozy. Well, Mary, I'm just going to go right, start right away, because every moment is precious with you. Um, I won't say start at the beginning yet, but you recently completed a book, although it may seem longer than that, um, Mutual Accompaniment with Yale University Press. And can you maybe talk a little bit about that um, as a step, perhaps, uh, that has moved you into this work of reparation? Well, thank, thank you, Gay, and thank you, Olivia, for the introduction I'm so excited about Karula Center um, visioning of Grace Village, and I'm so happy to add my own thoughts about reparations to, to your efforts there. So yes, in, um, in mutual accompaniment, and I, I guess I want to describe or define a little bit what accompaniment is, and I always begin with Paul Farmer, who's one of my heroes, who was a co-founder of Partners in Health, trying to create healthcare systems for um, 
the very poor around the world. And he describes accompaniment this way. To accompany somebody is to go somewhere with him or her, to break bread together, to be present on a journey with the beginning and an end. There's an element of mystery, of openness, of trust in accompaniment. The companion says, I'll go with you and support you on your journey wherever it leads. I'll share your fate for a while. And by a while, I don't mean a little while. Accompaniment is about sticking with the task until it's deemed completed, not by the accompanier, but by the person being accompanied. So in, in that book, I was trying to look at um, real world examples of where people came together to co-create an environment where human dignity and um, in some cases, other than human animals, dignity could be fostered um, in an atmosphere of, of peace and sharing. Uh, I used a lot the, the idea of the commons as a place where we have some of our needs met, but also have obligations um, to sustaining the commons and to um, offering mutual aid to other people. But what happens when um, the people that you are trying to be in relationship to have suffered historical harms that were perpetrated by members of the group that you're part of? Um, and this is, this is the work that I've been taking up in the last couple of years, um, which is a work mainly in, uh, intended for, for white people in the U.S., although I think it has um, parallels in other countries. Uh, um, we learn about the genocide of Native Americans. We learn about chattel slavery in the U.S., but in a very um, general way. And it's, it's very rare that white people actually get down to the task of how were my ancestors involved in these brutalities and atrocities? And how is my own living in the present perpetuating these um, in different forms uh, such that we have created this huge gap between uh, white communities and communities of color with respect to education, healthcare, um, wealth, land ownership, um, access to opportunities. So I've, I've been trying to go back. Um, I, I, was, I was born into a completely Southern family from Memphis, Tennessee, um, however, raised in New York. So had a kind of bicultural experience. And I, I had a sense that on one side of my family, there was probably enslavement of Africans, but I had never gotten really concrete about it. So in the last couple of years, I learned um, what um, um, Aurora Levins calls radical genealogy. Some people call it anti-racist or reparative genealogy. Um, and have tried to go back seven generations in my own family and trace um, their relationship in particular to slaveholding, enslaving, and um, to environmental um, degradation. And these two things sadly go very much together because when the, the main intention of a group or a family or individuals is to hoard resources and to accumulate excess land, wealth, and opportunities, um, we see the degradation of, of life all around them. Um, and that includes the earth, it includes other than human animals, and it certainly includes human beings. So my, my intent to do this was not to leave it as a kind of genealogical um, journey, but to, but to try to use um, different chapters from my own ancestors' lives over 400 years into portals, um, in port to use it as portals into uh, American history 
um, with the intent of offering reparations and trying to uh, become what I hope would be a better ancestor for, for my descendants, um, literal and figurative um, in the future. And one image that has really, um, I use in thinking about this, and I'll share uh, my desktop for a moment, um, is a memorial um, by Gunther Demning in, in Europe. Um, contrary to the huge memorials around the Holocaust, he created these stumbling stones outside of the last chosen dwelling of the people who were killed by the Holocaust. And literally, as you're walking, you, you feel a difference under your feet, and you have to look down and, in a way, are bowing to see the, the, the specific names and the specific places and where people ended up being murdered. He calls them stumbling stones. So I've been trying to use um, my own ancestors, particular ones, as, uh, as, as my own personal stumbling stones um, on, on a path toward, toward reparations. So that's a little intro. <laughs> <laughs> a tidbit. I love the, I just love that somatic visual stumbling stone work. It's just, uh, it, it really is incredible. Um, there was a couple things, so many things came to mind, and I'm just going to throw these out for you. One is when you were describing what accompanied one was the mystery. And the other is having to do with the fact of what the way you're describing this, it's it's not just a, a a blame shame, you know, you, you know, passing the ball back and forth. It, it really is, and maybe you can describe how it is or if it is, um, an unearthing and a rebirthing from the unconscious or the depths. Yes, and I should I should say that um, the stumbling stones. There are more than seventy thousand of them in Europe now. <laughs> In, in 21 different countries. We have a lot to stumble over. Um, the, the journey toward reparations um, is helped by, by getting very specific. And that means um, attempting to create a relationship with one's ancestors that's historically based and also has imaginal dimensions to it. Um, and it would look different for each person, obviously. Uh, however, I'm struck by how many people I know, white people I know, who have absolutely no idea of their of who their descendants really were, and and they've used genealogy in a very stereotypic way to um, feel proud of. Um, say, an ancestor who lived in a very large house or who created laws in Mississippi, et cetera, um, without really looking into the shadow side of what those laws were or who built the house and who, who was unhoused in relationship to it. I, I think about shame as also as the portal. Um, in many cultures, it's thought of as a as a no, one of the most noble emotions. And here I want to differentiate deserved shame from undeserved shame. Undeserved shame, for instance, if if you're if you're raped, you may feel a sense of shame, but it's there's nothing that you did to deserve that. But deserved shame um, is is a is a signal from from your deeper self that that you have violated some of your some of your most profound values and 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 beliefs and you can have that shame with respect to your own particular parts of your life and you can i think have it um ancestrally so that uh, there are ways that each of us can go about healing some of the harms that ancestors perpetrated um, 
by experiencing that shame um, and using it to inform us about how to live differently in relationship to others, in relationship to the wealth and resources, um, the land um, that, that, that we have access to. So guilt, guilt and shame, um, I think are very interesting emotions and very useful emotions and not ones, you know, it's not that we, we want to make another person feel guilty or shamed necessarily, although um, inducing shame can be part of um, social protests in some profound ways. But to use it um, as, as really a, a, a deep signal um, that, that can point to different ways of being in, in the present and the future. So they're really catalysts of transformation. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. That we should thank them, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I think in this country, my experience is that there, although there are individuals, as you describe, who are who embark on a genealogical journey, um, there's a tremendous amount of amnesia. Yes, where, where our culture seems, you know, so forward facing, and that. There's nothing is is important in the past, uh, and and that's engraved in the seminal writings of the formation. Of, I'll just speak for the United States. I think it's somewhat true for all of North America, uh, but in particular the United States. So it's engraved in so many slogans and so many images where you know you, you eschew the past. Or like you say, they valorize the past, but it's very selective. But essentially, yes. we're so forward looking that we're really not even looking. We even ignore the present because there's this, you know, constant, um, you know, fixation on on progress. Yes. And, and oftentimes we can't even really say amnesia because we simply do not know. It's not something that we individually knew and then forgot with regard to our families. It's something that we never took the time to to inquire about um, in my own family um, nobody ever said that that there were ancestors who had enslaved um, i i found that there were quakers on both sides of my family which really surprised me because i had become a quaker in my adulthood but i didn't know that there were quakers in my family but along with that i i, I couldn't just simply be sort of pleased that there were Quakers in my family because I discovered that there were a hundred years of Quakers who enslaved people and were deeply involved in the slave trade. And some of my ancestors were both um, Quakers and slave traders. Um, so we, yes, we, we, you know, I think about this conflict that happened around the 1619 project where um, our former president said uh, that he didn't want uh, white children to be uh, ashamed of, of their past and that he was going to begin American history in 1776, not in 1619. So we have a, a culture war going on uh, about um and here is where amnesia does come in. Well, let's just forget those things happened and, and go on. Um, but the problem is that they're still about us. Um, so, you know, whether we look at immigration policy or the prison industrial complex or the great wealth divides um, or the ways in which segregation has gotten re-inscribed re in the U.S., um, we, we see all these aftershadows of, of chattel slavery, and we see them in the environment as well, um, in the way that vast stretches of land were absolutely denuded. Um, obviously, the animal sacrifice there in order to, to do enforced monocropping um, that eventually kills the land and all the biodiversity there. Uh, for what? For um, the accumulation of excess wealth. 
So describe describe reparation in a I don't know I want to say it's synoptic. In other words, uh, right now, just to sort of in, in simplistic terms, in the United States, there are very two strong movements. One is having to do with African Americans, where there's reparation, and um, often it's compensation, um, financial compensation. These are just generalities. And then we we spoke with uh, Joe and, and Mary Beth, who are um, tribal peoples, Cherokee and Muscogee. And again, the there's a movement land back, which is uh, reparation in the form of reinstating sovereignty by, quote unquote, giving back the land. Um, how are those how what the way you describe the work though seems to be a very essential component other than uh, the mere transactions of compensation and do you see that as an integral component where it's um the giving of of currency the giving back etc does reparation in its broader sense really demand require um as a transformative agent an element that you're talking about in, for example, in the way in which you're engaged? Yeah, um, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen again, cause I've tried to, um, let's see, to, to create little sketches um, where we could begin to see it. Um, first of all, reparations is a process and it's not just like the event of delivering a check. Um, I've tried to, I've been a member of a number of groups in the last two years of white people um, who are committed to reparations, trying to, to do the psychological work um, that's really preparatory to engagement in reparations that has a spiritual dimension, a relational dimension, and yes, a resource dimension. And so some of what I've seen is, is, is in some people a readiness to not only be disturbed by thoughts, feelings, interactions, realizations regarding inequality and justice, but to turn around and face those with curiosity and openness and, and to really study into them. And in that process to forge a commitment, um, to explore what, what's their role, what's their ancestors' role in perpetuating the, the gross inequality and racial injustice that, that we're living right in the middle of. Um, let's see. And that, that requires some of the tasks that are really familiar from liberation psychology. One is, is the recovery of historical memory. You know, what exactly are we talking about in the particular areas where we're living? What are we talking about in the areas where our ancestors were living? What actually happened there? Um, and what were the ideologies, the cultural assumptions that have enabled us um, to not, to, to not remember um, how has um, colonialism with the pillar of, of racism, how has individualism um, so deeply affected us that uh, it, it has to become a, both a psychological and a social work, this, this work of reparations. And in, in working with historical memory, um, one realizes that things could have been different um, the, the, the boat in 1619 could have been turned away. Um, Jamestown could have been founded not as a company, but as a commons. Uh, there, there could have been vastly different relationships with the native peoples that people, um, whom British people met when they came here. And that, that begins to stoke a prophetic imagination about, well, it, it could have been different then, it could be different in our future. And what do we want to, what do we want to have it look like when, when people look back at us as their ancestors, 
what's the work that we want to be involved in that that points to these more um, beloved kinds of communities. So that the first step then is is to be able to acknowledge what are the harms, not to have it lost in a kind of fog. Um, there were so many bad things that happened. It was all terrible. I don't really want to think about it. But but it, through the particularity of one's family, um, one's communities that one's part of, um, what are the specific harms that have been perpetrated? And as we talked about, you know, bearing the shame and, and the collective remorse of that. Um, and I, I think that that often leads white people um, to see that while they've been able to accumulate, um, and this, of course, not all white people, but many, many accumulate um, quite a lot of resources and opportunities, that along with that has, has gone um, chopping off so much of being that um, we exist in, in a kind of spiritual poverty. Um, and to allow there to be mourning about that, and that mourning in itself points to new possibilities. Um, one of the central tenets of reparations is a commitment to the non-repeat of harm, including breaking the cycle of excess intergenerational wealth transfer, which is so tempting, you know, if people have inherited wealth to then pass their wealth along to their children. But what isn't, isn't really thought deeply enough about is what gets passed along with that wealth are all these ideologies, all this amnesia, all this failure to mourn and to acknowledge. And so how does one um, break off of that path and um, begin to redistribute wealth, land, opportunities, power, um, to return it back to the commons and in, in the United States and particularly back to BIPOC-led initiatives to create their own commons. Um, and so reparations has to get very specific of creating an actual plan um, for what, one's what, what were the harms, um, what does one need to divest oneself of? Um, and here divestment, instead of investment, divestment becomes a really important concept. Um, a colleague, Rob Pickler, talks about thinking about the return on divestment. So when we divest um, by, for instance, offering um, reparative funds to a community that's um, engendering Black ownership, um, Black agroforestry, um, farming, um, the, what's, what's the return on that, the, the beauty of that? Or when people give to Karulos, what they, what they are able to enjoy um, by seeing what, what grows out of that return. So there's a plan for divestiture and then embarking on that and embarking on it um, when it's possible to create relationships um, so that it isn't simply a check, but um, one becomes more knowledgeable about the work that's being done, not, not to intrude on projects where people want it to be centered and led by, for instance, um, Black people, but um, to, to offer one's curiosity and interest um, and to strengthen engagement and practices then of, of mutual accompaniment, aid, and solidarity when, 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 it's, when it's asked for. And I'll give an example in my own family. Um, I'll begin with uh, something from Faulkner. He describes the Mississippi woods, the rich, deep, black, alluvial soil, which would grow cotton taller than the head of a man on a horse, Already one jungle, one break, one impassable density of briar and cane and vine interlocking the sour of gum and cypress and hickory and pin oak and ash, printed now by the tracks of unalien shapes, bare 
and deer and panthers and bison and wolves and alligators and the myriad smaller beasts. Well, sadly, when Faulkner wrote this about the woods in the Delta of Mississippi, um, they were largely gone. And I found that um, my, my great-grandfather, R.J. Darnell, um, and his company uh, was one of the, the primary um, groups of lumber people after the Civil War who, who came to the Delta and um, largely deforested it. And from that um, created ever more uh, cotton plantations. Um, and I went there last spring um, to, to some of the fields that um, used to be um, the kind of uh, the kind of woods that we see here. Um, and this is a place called Panther Burn that my uh, great grandfather deforested. And you'll see um, the, the, the denuding, really the raping of the land for as far as you can see. And if you've never been to the Mississippi Delta, um, you can drive miles and miles and miles and miles through this, this kind of a landscape. Um, and so I, whoops. <laughs> so I, I became um, really interested in, in organizations and projects in the Delta that are involved in, in, in rebuilding um, Black-led communities and in agroforestry, um, engendering um, young people, um, Black young people who are interested in rebuilding the woods and also in making a profit off of forestry as well, but in a sustainable fashion. And that led me to, to several groups. Um, I went and visited them and in, in my plan to try to involve myself in a plan of divestiture over the next 10 years. And this was um, an incredible community called the New West Jackson Cooperative that took a 28 square block area that where most, well, more than half the houses were, were condemned and falling apart and has bought them up and is trying to revitalize um, the neighborhood through um, creating relationships with the people who live there and following their desires for what they want to see um, their, their neighborhood to be like. And this is um, the entrance to a small little farm they've created to try to bring um, healthy food in, into this neighborhood that, you know, used to look just like blocks and blocks like this. Um, Okay, back to you, Gay. <laughs> no, don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's wonderful. I mean, it's just uh, thank you for the illustration and looking at that process. I, I wonder if you could maybe uh, keep talking. And what is your prophetic vision? You know, if we're looking at it, like you said, re restoring the land, the animals, and the humans not to put them in separate categories, but that's a very um, very strong footprint. What are your thoughts and what is your prophetic vision? Well, I I see um, and I tried to to give a lot of examples about this in the book on mutual accompaniment. Um, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not really a good person for thinking at the policy level of things. What what I think about are small, um, earth-based communities of mutual aid um, that that are are created in in the face of all the the collective trauma and violence that people have gone through. That some of which will have. Elements of reconciliation will be communities that uh, people across racial, economic, 
um, religious, spiritual um, differences may come together to create, and and many that will be created um, by people within a group that has been um, that has had a very hard time. And Gay, you offered um, to share with me a paper that was about um, Donna Haraway's concept of the plantation of scene in which it was it was a, a critique of that by some geographers, Davies and others at um, um, Clark University, where I got my doctorate, um, who were talking about how even during the worst of chattel slavery, next to these vast plantations, there were plots of land where people could grow, their own food, the enslaved people could grow their own food and, and have their own labor um, create the bounty from which their their family could 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 have more food in the wake of, of being half starved by the conditions on the plantations. And and these writers refer to um, the way in which African traditions of agriculture and of thinking about the land in a more holistic way, um, survive through slavery and are, are very present now in people's attempts to, to create these land-based communities th throughout, throughout the United States right now. But they're facing incredible odds because um, in the last hundred years, African-American farmers have lost 90% of the land that they uh had had access to and you know when we think about complicity those of us who are academics often have our retirement funds in um, TIAA and unfortunately when I went to the Delta I found out that TIAA in order to create um, you know return on investment for academics is buying up huge swaths of of Mississippi for agribusiness, making it impossible for, almost impossible for African Americans to buy small pieces of land there. Um, and their TIA, TIAA is also doing that in the Amazon as well as other places. And so we, we, we have to face not only the, the situation of our ancestors, but the way in which colonial practices have, have um, with great power infiltrated our daily lives, you know, what's called coloniality and, and um, things that we think of as pretty innocent, like um, having some retirement after years of teaching actually is, is laced with the toxins of, of coloniality and actually, you know, work against the very specific kinds of projects that show hope um, for, for our common future with one another. Is there an intrinsic process in, in reparation the way you described in those beautiful slides, thank you so much, that there's an implicit um, transformation and shift in human identity or identities? Absolutely. So, I mean, part of, part of the terrible legacy for um, Euro Americans is is our continuing emphasis on individualism and the kind of starvation that that creates um, because in that paradigm you you are cut off from everything else from other people from land from other than human animals from spiritual um, forces and the shift in identity when you when you when you think about beloved communities or or commons um, is the shift that Thich Nhat Han and and many others have tutored us in um, a shift toward interdependence and of really deeply understanding that an emphasis on individual well being will 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 not end up in having an individual life that is full of thriving or a family or a community or a school or a bioregion that's thriving, that we have to see these things 
in utter interrelation and interdependence with with each other. So many, you you, you may call it making kin, um, making kin across all the the kind of false boundaries that have been created that foster separation in the name of mastery, control, hoarding, accumulation, profit. So these processes of reparation are essential for the survival. I, I don't like to use the survival. I would say the, the, the living, because survival is different than living, are essential for the quote-unquote agents or the beneficiaries of um, what has been passed. Yes, if we think about... Um, if one has a really, really huge debt and withholding the payment of that debt has caused death and misery to millions of people, then what kind of a future can we go toward if that debt is not acknowledged and repaid, whether that be land back, um, educational resources or literal funds, <laughs> right? So reparations is, is completely crucial and it should awaken us to situations in the present that we don't, that we don't often think about in terms of reparations. So for instance, I'm very involved in, in forced migration and the, the tragedy of imprisoning people uh, throughout the United States and the gulag of our detention prisons, uh, people who have been forced to leave their homes under incredible violence and disaster. Um, and this has been so for, you know, a hundred years of, of, of the way that we've been treating, treating people um, when they come across the border. It's gotten much worse in the last 30. But there's a group of people that, that also should be owed reparations. And so there are things happening in the moment, you know, people falsely imprisoned, um, people subjected to state violence through policing practices, you know, who deserve reparations. So hopefully if, if people move toward, you know, thinking about ancestral repair, that would heighten their awareness in the present. Of, of stopping, of putting their their body in, in in front of things that are happening in the present, stopping them happening before we get to even more disaster that requires even more repair. Can you um, just say a little more? I know that people will have a lot of questions and comments, so I won't take too much time, but can you maybe share with people your own um, your own arc and and what this in, you know doesn't have to start from the way beginning but what are the what are your own experiences and your own transformation through this process that you can share well you know i i became a student of colonialism and really studied um what what's the what's the game plan when it, when a power goes to another country and it 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 claims it claims that the land there is its own. It claims that the labor of the people there um, belongs to them. It take it displaces the people off the land. It believes that it 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 has every right to extract all the resources out of that place, um, using great violence and brutality to do that. I, so I was studying that in various places and what's the psychological cost to to the people who have suffered that and what's the psychological cost to the perpetrators. Um, but in this arc, you know, I'm trying to bring it back home, you know, to, to the U S and to the particularities of the regions that my family lived in and, and um, to, to, to what they, what they actually did, what was their mindset that um, enabled them to perpetrate the kinds of harms they did given the religious beliefs that they espoused, you know, how, how did they manage to live within that hypocrisy? That's been a really, um, I've just spent the last six months really focusing on, on that. Um, 
because I, I think it has, has a lot to teach us about, unfortunately, um, hypocrisy within our own lives, our, our own failures to, to truly, um, live lives of integrity where our actions and our, our values are, are really aligned in a way that can create in, in, in super fertile ways like your own have at Carulo. So, you know, your own, in, your own integrity that, that has enabled that work to thrive. You, when you talk about the specificity and, and emphasize the peculiar particularity of it all, is that a, a kind of, I'll use it in quotation marks, a process of re-indigenization? It potentially is. Like, I'm aware that... that um, and you're going home in a way where you've right, gone back right. to Mississippi, you've gone back to that land, you've gone back to those mm -hmm. places. Mm -hmm. And that that seems, you know, your emphasis on specificity and particularity is yes. very much of a of a hallmark of yeah. uh, many tribal and indigenous people. And when I'm part of these groups of white people working on these issues, the number of people go go back further than than you know into their Celtic origins, et cetera. But I can, since I never lived in those particular southern places, I don't quite feel it as my own indigenization, but I do feel um, I had had to take myself away from those areas. Um, I adopted four children of color and didn't want them to be in those areas. Um, so in the last two years, returning to them after 30 years of being away um, has been a profound experience for me because I'd never been in them um, with the time to really deeply explore their histories. Um, so in that way, yes, I feel I, I feel much more more rooted. And there was something I wanted to share about, about that, if I can find it. It comes, it comes from Aurora Levins Morales in her book, Medicine Stories. She's, she talks about radical genealogy and she describes, quote, the practice of rooting ourselves in the real concrete histories of our people, our families, our local communities, our ethnic communities. It's radical genealogy, history made personal. It's a keeping of accounts. It's the choice to bear witness to our specific, contradictory, historical identities in relation to one another. It's an accounting of the debts and assets we have inherited and acknowledging the precise nature of that inheritance as an act of spiritual and political integrity. And she describes that as raicism, um, meaning rootedness. So if we think of indigenization as, as um, become, be, becoming rooted or, or acknowledging one's roots, then, then yes, <laughs> I agree with you. Well, I guess I was using that term not necessarily in the physicality, although I do think that that's very critical um, in the sense of being present, you mm -hmm. know, and, and being present means acknowledging more than your own physical form, <laughs> your own mental and your own the individuality. And so there's that physicality, which I think is really important. But when I use that term, which I just sort of made up, was having to do with, I guess, really coming into presence and acknowledging um, one's place on the planet. And in so doing is a, uh, a re-embedding into the whole substrate of life and an erasure of I and you, where the we becomes the, the overarching understanding of life. Yes, yes, absolutely, the we. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. And I, I guess that ties back into my question about identity, where the identity is, is we. And Absolutely. understanding that what that is, it's not like, and, and I've been writing about that, that we're not talking about interconnection, although I understand that interbeing, you know, with Thich Nhat Hanh, but I, I believe what he's really saying is, you know, it's beneath that. It's not having to do with one object, one person Absolutely. connecting. It's yes. really at a deeper level of connection, which gets into spiritual images of understanding that the form 
and this thing which we embody, we rent, as someone said, I think it was Jack Cornfield, um, that what we rent, <laughs> that we're here, is really not the focus. The focus right. is really the, the deeper. And I think that's what you're talking about in your processes of reparation. Yes, I completely agree. <laughs> you put it really well. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll turn you over. I have one more question because I'm afraid someone... Um, but what that is, is that uh, that as we engage individually in these processes of reparation, in these processes of our ancestral discovery, discovery, uh, it's it's a it's not a comfortable zone, and I guess can you maybe speak a little bit about that of uh, that dis, you know that these are awkward that there is an awkwardness potentially there is an uncomfortableness and how maybe we can expand around those feelings so that they're not so overwhelming and they don't collapse into something which is negative and pushes us back um, on quote unquote both sides can you maybe speak a little bit mm -hmm. about that yeah. My, my colleague Lucy Duncan says that we have to remember that, that we engage reparations and not, not only as an obligation, but as a, as a way to free ourselves, <laughs> to liberate ourselves. And um, yes, as I've been in circles where people for the first time discover uh, a list of people there third great grandfather enslaved or a will where their second great grandmother bequeathed um, someone she had enslaved to a daughter. Um, people are, are ashamed and um, horrified actually. Um, but there's something else that's, that, that really does balance um, the, the fear, the shame, the guilt, the overwhelm of, of radical genealogy. And, and that is the, the, the shine of the truth, knowing, knowing with some specificity, claiming uh, the stories that, are, that really belong to one's life. Um, doing that with other people, I think, is really important. Having a kind of a sangha or very, I have a, several sanghas doing this work. Um, and there's a lot of um, curiosity, interest, joy, sharing, um, relief around divestiture, um, uh, inspiration by seeing what people are doing in their efforts to repair that really are um, prefigurations of, of the future we want to live into. So I haven't yet found a person who's just like overcome by it all, you know? Um, and, and that's not to say one doesn't have nightmares, um, when, that one doesn't have days of overwhelm and sadness and mourning and all of that. But but it's it's part of a larger that the repair is is also you know for oneself and one's family and one's future descendants. And just the image that you brought up, um, I kept thinking about ants. You know <laughs> that every everyone's doing their ant thing. You know what I mean? But there's this larger colony, not to use that yeah. term, but I mean this larger group um, that is that is functioning. You know that. Um, um, I've forgotten his name now. I shouldn't forget it. Um, oh, Eugene Marais. And he wrote The Soul of the White Ant. And he, those were termites in South Africa. And he was talking about that. And he actually even drew on the, the notion of the collective psyche of, of C.G. Jung at that time. But there's that whole notion that the individuals are engaged in the same work, yeah, the same individual work with this idea that it, it's within this transformative body. Right. I, I wanted to share um, a few of the groups, you know, if people are interested in diving into this work. Um, and, and I'll just say a word about the first one coming to the table is a, is a group um, of people who have ancestors who were formerly enslaved and people who have ancestors who were former enslavers um, meeting together regionally. Um, 
doing genealogy, sometimes able to meet um, like a, a person who's an ancestor of a former enslaver being able to meet descendants of people that their family had enslaved and re really working at reparations and reconciliation. Um, these are all incredible groups um, that I can highly recommend from my own participation in most of them. And I'll say a little bit of word about the, the last one, which is a, a Quaker led group, um, which is, there's also the gift of, in the process of diverse, divestiture, learning what is enough. You know, um, how much does one actually need to live a good life? And um, how to really uh, reflect on that over time and keep that as a question as one's involved in investment and in, in divestiture. Thank you so much, Mary. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Olivia, you can take over. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Mary. That's incredible. I'm, we're learning so much. Um, and I'm sure people have questions. If anyone would like to, um, you're welcome to type it into the chat. Or if you prefer to ask your own question, um, you can use the raise hand button um, as well. So I'll give everyone a couple of minutes here. Yes, um, Deanne, looks like your hand is raised. I want to ask Mary a question. Mary, thank you deeply for your work. When I hear white work, I think about pain work. And given the relations of the past for 500 years. And so I'm wondering how people embracing this work can, and to use a Jamaican expression, take good care. How, how do people take good care? Yeah. Oh, Diane, it's wonderful to hear your voice. Thank you for being here. And you too, Liz. Um, well, I mean, this is re these have really been my community for the, you know, since I retired, I I've joined these groups and I've met so many new friends and been inspired by, by people who have been doing this work you know, much longer than myself. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of love, you know, I mean, there, there's, and there's a lot of intelligence amongst these groups of people um, who are really uh, after, after the truth. And, and so there, it, it's an incredibly supportive set of communities um, for the, the difficult work of looking at the kind of murderous ways that um, white people um, have 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 lived into. Um, is that what you mean? I mean, whatever you have experienced, and that's so helpful to think about what happens between people and what is generated by these encounters, the love that you talk about, the sharing of knowledge, the truth seeking, perhaps the truth realization, I don't know. Yeah, and, you know, I, for instance, last week I was with a small group of um, Quakers who are deeply involved in reparations, and we meet once a month. And uh well, one of the one of the members had been talking about the way that um, reparations should have to do with relationship, also. But you know, as white people um, introduce themselves to some um, BIPOC-led groups, oftentimes um, black people might not want a relationship with a white person. <laughs> they they want relationship with with other black people. And so this was an issue that we were, as white people, we were able to discuss, you know, ways that our feelings had been a little hurt at times, um, but trying not to, trying not to intrude, um, tr trying to be respectful 
um, trying to take the temperature of situations, et cetera. So that there, you know, just like there are many conversations amongst Black people that you would never think of having with white people, there are also these conversations that white people have about, about living in this, in this land um, that, that, are, that are really difficult. And, um, you know, where people have had a lot of difficult experiences. And so th the development of a kind of calling in and um, supportive community while, while working on the racism um, um, amongst us it has been super important. And in, and in that way, also inspirational, even though difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Liz, hi. You're muted. Sorry okay. about that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on my phone, which I'm usually not using. So <laughs> sorry about that. Um, great to see you, Mary and Gay and Olivia um, and everyone. Um, uh, my kind of, I guess, question or observation would be about the idea of hoarding and accumulation that you had mentioned. Um, because as you were speaking, you know, I was sort of having these images of not just, you know, 21st century hoarding um, of, you know, digital devices or whatever it may be, but my mind also went back to um, a time when that was actually very helpful, you know, in our ancestral past to get us through winter or, you know, I thought of survivalists who, need to hoard, you know, berries or whatever it is, because that's the only way that they'll make it um, to the spring. So, you know, in that sort of flash, it, it really reminded me of something like, um, almost like the obesity epidemic, and how we have this predisp predisposition, you know, based on evolutionary need, right, to seek out high caloric foods, and but in a situation where the environment's changed, where we have calories in abundance, that that becomes problematic. So, I guess my question um, would be, you know, given that there is this evolutionary, you know, need and basis for, well, at least I would argue for hoarding, um, you know, as a mechanism of survival, um, and even thinking of squirrels now as I speak, <laughs> the squirrels in my yard who have their caches, you know, all along the lawn. Um, at what point is it helpful? And then at what point is it problematic? I mean, is there kind of a line in the sand or is that sort of an individual, you know, something that we have to check in on an individual basis? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I think that there's a difference between setting aside um, resources that you're going to need because you're in a period where the, there's, um, you know, a, a lack of resources. and Supporting resources in ways that harm other people. So hoarding um, has been very inflected by individualism, you know, hoarding by an individual or by a family and passing wealth down intergenerationally is very different from um, the way that that commons earlier um, were enacted so that um, people were working together to to create resources that were needed and were taking from the commons what they needed but but not more than they needed and this is where the the meditation on enough is really important and there were also practices of leaving behind enough for for people who, who had even less than 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 you had, um, so that people could 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 scavenge food that they might need. So I think I think hoarding means something very different, you know, presently than than it did um, when when a group of people needed to set aside in a seasonal kind of a way. Um, but you know there are many many reasons for hoarding, but when, for instance, when when we invest in the stock market or uh, invest in a house, and then it it 
doubles in value without any labor on our part. And we keep that return while other people don't have the house and don't have the investments. Um, then there's something um, about the, the hoarding that causes damages. And of course, that was, that's, that's multiplied when we look at how many people, like if we're living a life of, of comfort, how many people are not living a life of comfort in order to sustain us. And being in New York City, I mean, you can just see it. You just walk out your door and you see it. Um, you see the, the, the people who have just come without documents and are now on bicycles delivering Grubhub and, you know, maybe in the end making $5 an hour. Um, but I, I got my hot Indian supper, you know. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? I have a question. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks, Liz, for bringing that. I, I could follow up with what I was going to say is what are your thoughts in terms of uh, the examples that you're working on um, with reparations um, in between human groups and cultures and things like that? What role does consideration of nature play and animals play? Um, so, for example, if we now recognize that animals will just be narrow, but the animals, trees, and I would say all, all elements of the world of the, of the planet um, have the capacities to think, feel, et cetera, that we do, AKA trans species psychology, but in a broader, deeper way, um, shouldn't, should they be part of the conversation? And also with that understanding, what we're doing is unraveling again, the very much of the colonial um, your American um, uh, caricature and distortion of what animals are, who animals are, what they do, and everything like that. Should nature, how, what role should nature play in these dialogues? Is nature and, and really understanding the rest of the world, um, other than these different humans, um, is that a vital third party that needs to be in the conversation? Absolutely, because I think the same disastrous ideologies that have affected human communities have affected um, other than human animal communities and, and earth, trees, waters, etc. Um, so I think we have to we have to look at it all together. Um, how do you bring that voice in, for example, in some of the groups that you're working in? How would that come in other than um, uh, in a kind of a transactional way or a resource kind of way? Uh, how do we bring in the philosophies, the ontologies of the rest of, of non-humans into these reparation processes? Well, I mean, you know far more about this than I do. Let's face it. Um, but no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but to begin with, we we have to re restore ecosystems that have been devastated, like that field I showed you <laughs> in Panther Burn. Yeah, um, and you know that can happen. Sometimes that can only happen on a small scale. Sometimes it can happen on a really large scale, like. Sebastião Salgado's, you know, bringing back to life the the forest in Brazil that he grew up um, in that had been turned into a desert. Um, it, it, I mean, it has to do in the end, doesn't it, with with sensitivity to the sentience of of all living things, um, and not being so human centered that one can't even allow them into the conversation i mean we i'm talking about ancestors but but we could just as well be talking about i mean i i, I i'm thinking about imagining the, the the voices of my ancestors but as as you're doing at carulos you're you're attending to the voices of particular animal communities and that's that's really the part of the beauty of what you you're bringing bringing to the table. 
I guess I'm very, you know, when we're looking, zooming back and, you know, that magic 500 years, <laughs> or in some cases, 10,000 years, which is the beginning, at least anthropologists talk about it as the beginning, the beginning of the end, the Anthropocene with the start of agriculture and this uh, concentration of human populations, etc. But as um, people are, or anthropologists are want to say is that 95% of the human record ancestry um were were not uh were not anthropocentric were um basically live were gatherers not hunter gatherers that's another myth were gatherers and very much living along the lines of um, a deer or a squirrel or or things like that um i guess that's what i'm trying to say is is to kind of do we need in these conversations or is it how do we bring those conversations in um in a way that still honors the immediacy of say racial discrimination, the past, all those kinds of conflicts and, and pain. How do we bring that very, very important from my point of view, absolutely crucial viewpoint mm. of a world that is way beyond the immediacy of the colonial 500 years. Does that make sense? Do you see what I'm saying? In other words, mm -hmm. like just in Liz's example of the squirrel, you know, what I would say is that the squirrel, for example, um, is not a hoarder because that squirrel is moving with the uh, with with the rhythm of nature. And therefore, um, and we can attest to that just by pre-colonial or the, the first people that came to the United States, for example, their testimony of the richesse of, of nature. You know, the bays were full of oysters and, you know, da, 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 da. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that how, the, I think there's a difficulty there. I, I, I encounter that, that, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we can get to that later. But to me, I think that that's how we need to Im, even engage and approach the specificity of the colonial, coloni coloniality, as you call it. But from that viewpoint of this is the substrate from which we really need to return yes yes and i find I guess, it difficult i guess to I, find it difficult to to uh to incorporate that or to bring that into kind of a dialogue without it being interpreted um i mean this is not a judgment but in the sense of the immediacy um and that at seeing this as it is as a distraction or as a way of diluting the uh the press of of uh immediate reparation I mean, where where I am there is is holding them right together, <laughs> trying to hold them together. Because as I said, I think I think that that, that it's it's this it's the same mindset that has been so destructive to both, and and therefore to the totality. Um, how to bring how to center the restoration from those voices? I'm not there yet. <laughs> but I think you're 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 getting there. <laughs> but I think it's very important and just like learning centering the voices and practices of indigenous peoples mm -hmm. um as we deal with creating more sustainable environments and stopping the destruction of the ones we haven't yet destroyed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have any other questions before we wrap up? If not, then just thank you so much, Mary, this for your incredible um sharing your incredible work with us. It's been it's been amazing to hear about everything that you've done and, and we look forward to your us. ongoing book. Correct. Yes. <laughs> thank you to both of you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Absolutely. And thank you to everybody for, for all of your questions. It's been a great conversation with everyone today. Um, our next speaker and our final speaker in our um, autumn series will be a week from today, Sunday, December 11th at 10 o'clock Pacific time. Uh, we will be joined by Dina Metzger, a writer, healer, and teacher whose work spans multiple genres, including the novel, poetry, nonfiction, and plays uh, to discuss 19 ways to a viable future for all beings. 
So thank you again, Mary and Gay and all of our audience members today. It was really great to be here with all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Take Lots care, everyone. Lots of love. <laughs> Thank you.